Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. For those of you who have been listening, you already know, and for anybody that's just tuning in, I, for the first time, I spent 25 years in prison. I've been out now for six months. I am an advocate for prison reform. While I was in prison, uh, my best friend and cellmate, Brent McCall, and I wrote a book called Down the Rabbit Hole, How the Culture of Corrections Encourages Crime. I am very interested in the criminal justice system, and we've got the perfect guest here today to talk about it. He's a nationally recognized expert on criminal justice reform. He spent 24 years in the Connecticut State Legislature. He was Governor Malloy of Connecticut's Undersecretary of Criminal Justice Policy and Planning, and he is currently an Associate Professor in Criminal Justice at the University of New Haven. Professor Michael Lawler, welcome to the show. Hey, Michael. Call me Mike, by the way. It's okay. Still, All right. Well, I had to give the, the formal introduction. Now, now oh, yeah, I can no, go. There. There's there's no, protocols no. we have to go through. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure who invented them, but whatever. <clears throat> there you go. So right around the time that Brent McCall and I wrote down the rabbit hole, you were in the Malloy administration here in Connecticut. And Governor Malloy and yourself were touting the successes of the reforms that were being passed. And what you, the two of you were saying was running so counter to my daily lived experience in corrections that I've been wanting to talk to you for quite some time. Now, I probably didn't reach out because I just figured, well, I am a guy that's in prison. What are the chances this you know, undersecretary of criminal justice policy is going to talk to me? But now that I've reached out to you, you responded and agreed to come on. So it's great. So I want to talk about the, some of the reforms and some of the policies in Connecticut. But before that, I, I think the audience needs to know, what are the purposes, or at least the stated purposes, of incarceration? Well, uh, incarceration by itself, right, and which is only one part of the criminal justice system, is, you know, theoretically, there's four purposes. One is incapacitation, meaning you're out of circulation, you can't do anything in the community. Uh, the other is... Uh, reform you know uh the other is retribution you know you get what you deserve and i'm trying to remember the fourth one now um uh, uh i don't know there, there's but deterrence deterrence correct yeah deterrence there you go. is the fourth. There you go. so and, and but you know to me uh this is not you, you know if you look only at incarceration uh i think you're missing the bigger picture, number one, and 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 I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk a lot more about this. But uh, you know, incar incarceration should be an extremely limited, play an extremely limited role in the criminal justice process. In fact, most of what the criminal justice system tries to do uh, can't really be effectively done within the criminal justice system, right? So. Uh, reorienting things, you know, turning this battleship around is a complicated process. So out of the four things, and, and I think you and I are going to be in agreement on a lot of, a lot of stuff. I think that what the, or what I've experienced is that the prison system really only does one thing. Well, it incapacitates, it doesn't effectively punish, it doesn't deter, and it doesn't rehabilitate Yeah, by effectively punishment punish let me be clear being deprived of liberty is punishing right in and of itself so when i say talk about effective punishment ideally punishment is supposed to serve as a deterrent it's supposed to be clear it's supposed to be demonstrated what you're being punished for and you're supposed to be shown an alternative behavior so while we're deprived of liberty in prison we're able to basically run wild in prison playing games gambling, arguing, whatever, most of the stuff that we did while we were free. So in that sense, it's not, neither a punishment nor a deterrent. And ideally, the punishment and deterrent aspects serve as a motivator, or ought to serve as a motivator for rehabilitation. So if you don't have the punishment and the deterrent factor, there's really no motive to rehabilitate. Because the person is getting rewarded ultimately already for their behavior. Aside from being deprived of liberty, in prison, when you misbehave, you 
get your way an awful lot. You get the extra amenities, whether they be extra recreation, extra showers, food you're not supposed to be have, contraband items, whatever. And the rules aren't usually enforced, so you get away with it. So that's what I mean when I say it's not punishing. I just want to be clear because obviously, like I said, it is a punishment to be deprived of liberty. Yeah. So one of the signature or maybe the signature criminal justice reforms of the Malloy administration were what is called the risk reduction earn credit program mm -hmm. or act. So can you just explain what is risk reduction earn credit? Yeah. So it's important to go back a little bit in history to get a sense of where that particular mechanism comes in to play. Uh, so, you know, in 1981, uh, in order to get tough on crime, the legislature abolished parole altogether. So there was no more parole for people being incarcerated after that point. Hold on a second. I, I I'm, hate to interrupt, but that's not actually accurate. After 1981, they abolished Well, you got to let me finish, Michael. You got to let me finish, right? Okay, so I'm sorry. Okay. If, if you committed your crimes after November uh, 1981, uh, at that point, there was no more parole for you, right? And uh, but there continue to be a variety of good time credit mechanisms. So there was a whole bunch of them, but essentially they took about a third off your sentence. Plus, back then, uh, Connecticut switched from indeterminate sentences to determinate sentences, mm -hmm. meaning back in the day, back when America was great. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, if you got convicted of murder, you'd usually get a sentence 25 to life, which meant at after you've served 25 years, you are eligible for parole. And that 25 years got reduced by about a third because of all these different good time credits. So in theory, if you got a life sentence for something you did in 1975, you would be eligible to be released after about 17 or 18 years, right? Uh, fast forward, in the early 1990s, uh, because uh, prison prison overcrowding had become a huge issue here in Connecticut. We went from, you know, some interesting numbers here, right? So in 1960 in Connecticut, we had about 3,000 people incarcerated. 1970, 3,000. 1980, 3,000. 1986, 6,000. 1996, 16,000. In order to accommodate that jump of about 10,000, Connecticut had to build 10,000 prison beds, which we did. Uh, but while those prison beds were being constructed, there was way uh, too many people being sent into prison. And as a result, uh, a mechanism called supervised home release was developed. And by and large, people were doing about 10% of whatever sentence they got imposed on them, not because they got out on parole, because parole didn't exist, but because they got out on supervised home release. Okay, so fine. 1992, I think it was, the, the legislature said, okay, in order to get tough on crime, we're going to abolish good time credits, but we're going to reestablish parole. And then a couple of years later, because of federal incentive uh, where the feds would give us, would reimburse most of the money to build new prison beds, if we agreed that violent offenders would do 85% of their sentence, mm -hmm. Connecticut did that to get the money. But because nobody got good time credits, the 85% was a real 85% here compared to, let's say, Texas, where violent offenders are eligible for parole after 50%. And they get about, uh, they get one day off for every two days served as a violent offender in Texas, right? So Connecticut ended up, ironically, as, you know, the, the sentences that were being imposed and the sentences that were being served were way longer than anywhere else. So Fast forward, um, in the late 2008, 9, 10, in there, the former Commissioner of Correction, Theresa Lance, who had been appointed under a Republican administration, John, John Rowland and then Jody Rell, she was saying, you know, the, 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 the absence of any kind of credit type incentive in our system makes it more difficult for us to manage uh, behavior of people who are incarcerated. We like to incentivize good behavior and disincentivize bad behavior. So she looked at a bunch of different options for uh, for establishing some sort of credit thing, and one of which was what turned into be the REC credits, the risk reduction earned credits. And so the way this works is that uh, a person who is sentenced can get up to five days a month off their sentence if they comply 
with their offender accountability plan, which I'm sure you're aware is something that is uh, developed individually for every person when they uh, uh, after they've been sentenced. So this, uh, so Malloy is now governor, um, and we decide that makes sense, right? It's better than nothing. And so we enact the rec credits and immediately, uh, and in many ways, predictably, uh, the Republicans in the legislature just went apoplectic and uh, pretty much criticized Malloy nonstop for the next four or five years as that thing plays. So that's where it comes from. It's an attempt to do what pretty much every other state does, provide mm -hmm. some type of credit system comes off your system, uh, off your sentence. Now, interestingly, because of the pressure from Republicans, um, the, there was a modification to the rec credits a couple of years later, where if you were sentenced for a violent crime and therefore had to do 85 uh, percent, that that the, the 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 new law said you have to do 85 percent of the sentence that was imposed in court, whether or not you've accumulated good time credit. So mm -hmm. basically, the way it stands at the moment is uh, people who are doing a bid for a, what is considered a violent crime are usually doing about 85 percent before they're eligible to to discharge or be released on parole. OK, so I think that both the in the state, the Democrats claim of uh, this being a great program, Mr. I, I, Mark. Michael, I don't think anybody claimed it's a great program. Well, it's better than it, what it used to be. It, well, I'm it, I'm going to tell I'm going to argue or make the case that it's a useless program. But I also okay. think that the Republican critics and my friend Len Susio, former state senator, was maybe the biggest critic. My issue, and I've told him this with his critique, is that, look, the guy guy gets out now or he gets out six months from now. Because you, you, unless you're doing a substantial amount of time, I mean, I did 25 years and I think I ended up getting three years off my sentence total with the, the risk reduction or credit. So mm -hmm. in, if a, the, the main issue to me is what happens in the prison, right? Because if a guy is not rehabilitated, what difference does it make if he goes home now or in, in six months? If, if he's a threat, he's going to be a threat six months from now. So in that respect, I think that the claims that this is a danger to society are, are just m misstated. Because yeah. they got, it's not like you're letting people out who weren't going to get out. So I, yeah. so on that end, I think. But as far as it, the risk reduction earn credit, I, I it's hard for me to fathom how this program could either reduce risk. And I know the credits aren't earned. And I'll tell you how I know they're not earned. Yeah. On my OAP, the Offender Accountability Program, I was assigned three programs initially, right? I had to work in the wood shop, which I had already been doing. I was assigned to a lifers group. The lifers group didn't exist. It was it, it didn't exist. There was no lifers group. Even when the lifers group existed, it wasn't a rehabilitation program. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was an addiction service referral. I continued to get risk reduction earned credits for uh, that was I think 2011. I want to say it came in, and so in 2012, I lost my job in the wood shop. So I was no longer doing that. I Where never. Were you stopped, at where were you at? I was at McDougal oh. Correctional Institution and McDougal. later at Osborne. Got it. I never set foot in a lifers group. Oh. And yet I was receiving these credits for attending a program that never existed. That Well, it did, never existed as far as when the implementation of the rec came in. And for a woodshop job that I didn't have. And for an addiction service reference that I never went to. But I was still getting these credits. The rules in prison are not enforced. There's a full third of them that are almost never enforced. The ones that are enforced are enforced haphazardly. My point is that you've got guys I know that if I was if, if a cop or CO were paying attention, he could write them up three, four times a day and they're not. So they're not in real compliance. It's a charade. It looks like they're behaving, but they really aren't. Yeah, and well, so how, I mean, so how it, it are they, solves... how are the credits earned? And then the programming, you could literally go sit in a program, not participate at all, sit in the back of the room and you're going to get the same credit as someone participating. I know guys that have put in serious work for rehabilitation who would have the same thing to show as guys who are gambling and doing drugs. Mm. Well, a couple of things. First of all, um, 
no one ever claimed it's a great success. Just to be clear, it's better than ha having no opportunity to earn any credits at all. So that's good. Why would that be the case? Because, well, this gets to a bigger question about what uh, that the sort of generally speaking policy in the United States about incarceration, mm -hmm. the length of incarceration kind of stuff is is to me like the fundamental problem. I mean, there's way more people incarcerated here than really need to be incarcerated. I agree with that. And and the kinds of sentences that are imposed in this country, including in the state, are just completely off the charts compared to other countries. Right. And I've been in prisons in a lot of other places. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the, the and, and like I said earlier, right, in Texas, of all the places, right, the, you get as a violent offender, you get one day off for every two days served. So it's a third right off the top of your sentence. So um, these how you take these political steps, how do you undo? A policy which said no good time credits of any type ever right and and the, the, you have to explain what you're proposing to do and why right and so um i think it would not have been possible to pass a law that says you get one day off or two day every two days you serve uh for good time mm -hmm. uh, but it was more doable to establish a rec credit system now in terms of outcomes right one thing we do know uh that over the last, what is it now, 12 years, the amount of assaults uh, inmate on inmate and, and inmate on staff have, have dropped measurably, right? And so who knows why exactly that's happened, but one of the possible explanations is that if anything like that happens, you potentially you're gonna lose your rec credit. So there's things like that you can look at that seem like it might've had a measurable effect, but um, you know, no one is arguing that it's, the, it's 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 utopia at all right it's just it was a political way to build in some type of uh discount um into the time served so the two results that you just pointed to one was getting guys out of prison sooner and two was it reduced not everybody uh, no no but the people yeah the people that are in compliance or that actually get the credits because not everybody's eligible and right. the reduction in assaults on, you know, between inmates and on staff, I have no doubt that it would lead to a reduction in serious assaults because now guys know that they want to go home. So they'll refrain from yeah. doing that type of serious stuff. And obviously if you're creating a system to let people out early, it's going to let people out early. What I'm saying is this, the purpose of this is to help reform offenders so that when they get out, they're not going to reoffend. Here's the problem: the, the the it's a charade, and every inmate in the system knows it's a charade. This the message that ends up getting sent to inmates is that everybody's a crook. That look, this is just a charade. We know it. You get on a waiting list for five years, never step foot in a program, you get credit. What a joke! You don't have to participate. What a joke! The rules aren't enforced. It's a joke. The one of the worst messages you can send to an offender is that everybody is just like him because what he ends up thinking or or she I, I use the masculine because I was in a man's prison obviously the, the but when he thinks that everybody's a crook but he just happened to get caught game over there's no real need to 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 change but but that is the purpose I mean the the arguments have been made that this program it's lowered recidivism rates it's reformed offenders it's well, the lower. recidivism is down. Well, sure. the recidivism rate was actually dropping prior to Malloy taking right. office, and it was dropping at a faster rate than it did after he took office. I don't, I don't know about that, but well, I mean, well, for anybody you know listening, Google it. That's all. That's all I could say. I've been looking at this for years, and it was dropping faster before he took office. Continued to drop. Why is? But furthermore, recidivist rates can drop for a. Um, thousands of reasons right lower teenage males in the population uh, uh, cops aren't enforcing rules any any longer marijuana laws are relaxed parole officers aren't violating uh plus the overdose deaths that have increased as a result of the fentanyl onslaught so guys are getting out of prison and dying all these things can help and probably things that i'm never even considered to to lower recidivist rate why it was dropping before malloy took office i ultimately don't know Mm -hmm. But I do know that this program does not reform offenders. And if the claim is that that's not what it's for, well, then that's a different argument altogether. But no. it has been claimed that it does reform offenders. I, I don't, you know, having been in the middle of that, I don't recall people making that specific argument. I, you know, that's 
that's what it says. That's what the title says. Um, it's better than nothing. It was a way to uh, develop a system which would be more politically palatable because it wasn't just simply good time credits. So, I mean, it could be better, but, you know, in an ideal world, the system would be run very differently than it's run now, in my that's, opinion. That's true. So this notion of evidence-based, all throughout Connecticut's prisons, there's, in the prisons I've been in, I've only been in two, but from what I understand, this is par for the course. There are signs about global leadership, evidence-based programs, evidence-based practices. That's that's the sort of catchphrase. So three staple programs that are in Connecticut's prisons, Alternative to Violence Project, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous. Are you aware of any evidence that shows that these programs help to reform offenders? Yeah, I um, <laughs> I don't think a correctional institution is a great place to provide programming like this. Right? I really don't. Just in the same way, it's not a great place to provide health care, let alone mental health care. So um, I, I would be skeptical about any claim that good things can be accomplished in a prison in the United States. Now, you could run the place very differently, and I've seen other <laughs> models of how to do this where you might actually get some decent results. But, you know, I think it's a fool's errand to try and get good outcomes out of correctional facilities. Well, I agree there. I don't, well, let me say, I, I agree given that the way that the correctional facilities are run, but I think that the, that's exactly your point. Like I remember um, Roland Cook, Scott Semple also when he was uh, the commissioner and then Roland Cook was the commissioner here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And they touted a lot of the programmings, programming. One of the programs they touted was the true unit that is in Cheshire. That's where lifer inmates uh, mentor young guys that are coming into the system and they try to help them out, whatever. Right. Are you aware of any, of any programs in Connecticut been audited for what they call therapeutic integrity to make sure that these programs are run in accordance with how they're designed to run? Yeah. So the true unit in particular, and there's one in the women's prison uh, at York called the worth unit um yeah they're run basically by well the, the auditing such as it exists it is done through the vera institute of justice they're the ones who do all the training etc and they've contracted out for some uh, outcome audits right so it, it's worth noting however that the, the true unit the model was really interrupted significantly by the covid thing sure. because you know people were locked down for a couple of years so, um, yeah, I mean, I've been to the true unit a bunch of times. Um, it is an environment completely and totally different than what you would have been accustomed to at McDougal or Osborne. Um, it's not like what you see in Northern Europe, but it is inspired by the way prisons are run in Northern Europe. And it ideally would be a model for the rest of the uh, Department of Correction in Connecticut. Uh, you know, it's very, it's much more chill than you'd experience in any other kind of prison in the U.S., let alone in Connecticut. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, there are almost no incidents there. There are almost no injuries. There are almost no contraband uh, in that, in those units. There's two units in Cheshire now, and there's one at, at York. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge improvement on what had been the case in the past. Okay. So the first thing, the true unit was, it was claimed that Scott Semple, I think it was, went to Germany and I they looked too. at the I German with, system. I okay. And Malloy was there too. Yeah. So they say, oh, that's where we got the idea. Well, first of all, the German system, yes, the people that deal with the inmates have to go two years. They have to go through of training to Correct. deal with people in the Correct. true unit. That's not the case. No. The other, th they don't, their guards aren't going through two years of psychological training to deal with inmates. That's not happening in Connecticut unless- Correct. That's right. right. So, but that's what Germany is. The other thing is the inmates that go and sign up for the true unit get special privileges. That's right. That inmates outside the true unit don't get. I'm talking about the mentors. So there's an incentive right. for them to, to, to behave just to go do that. I know personally a lot of those guys. I wouldn't let them babysit my dog, let alone mentor a young offender. That's just personal experience. I can't Which quantify guys are you talking that. About? Which guys are you talking about? 
<laughs> I'm not names. I'm, are you talking about? I'm the, talking about the mentors. I mean, I say so names. I don't care. That, been... that doesn't matter to me. But uh, the, but the, the mentors, the guys that were up there mentoring. I know some of the yeah. guys are good guys. Some some aren't so good. What I do know is that there's an incentive to pretend to be something they're not. I also know, well, I shouldn't say I know because I haven't been there, but I've heard through the grapevine amongst inmates that the offenses that are committed under up there are swept under the rug. Why? Because there's an incentive to make it look good for the prison system. If if guys get into a fight, if I get into a fight with a guy in population, we're both going to the box. They get into a fight up there and they have a sit down from what I understand and they talk about it and move on from it. So, right. so that, so that's not getting reported and you say, oh, look, they're not having violence. Well, you wouldn't know because it's not reported. I'm not sure it's not reported, but when it happens, it's handled differently, but it's almost never happened. So, well, how would we know if they're not reporting it? No, if there's, if, if there's a staff member who gets injured, no, no, no. I'm talking about a fight between inmates. If there's an inmate who gets injured, that's going to get reported. There's going to be. Well, well, if there's a serious injury, I'm talking about just your run of the mill fights. I know guys in prison all the time get into cell fights that don't get reported. I mean, that no one knows about, no one's injured. Okay. Listen, it's possible. I've been in there a million times. I've spoken to people who are incarcerated there. Um, I've spoken to the staff, you know, I, 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 that's never, usually people will tell you stuff off the record. Right. And that's never happened to me. Right. So, okay. So what, what evidence is there that the true unit helps to reduce recidivism? Now, what I, let me just, I'm going to just, so I can be clear what I'm talking about. There's in the literature, there's evidence-based practices, the risk need responsivity model of corrections where they, you know, where you have proper assessment, you have cognitive behavioral therapy addressed to criminogenic needs, you have core correctional practices implemented. And in order to test the effectiveness of these things, you need to have proper control groups, random assignment, that type of thing. Programs are audited for effectiveness. For the true unit, what evidence is there that any of that is taking place? Well, it's like I said, it's it's still relatively new, right? And it was interrupted by for two years by COVID. Sure. So uh, it didn't even get established I think, until 2016, and uh, and you know, so it's a little early for that, a little premature. Um, what I think it really is, however, the true unit is a prototype of a different way of running a department of correction, right? So um, the the relationships between the staff and the people incarcerated are much less, you know, let's just say formal, right? And and uh, it, it's not focused on punishment, right? It's focused on dealing with people's issues. And, you know, the, the younger guys in there, the mentees are typically under 25 years old, almost all of them, have I mean they're all sentenced um they're almost all of them have had extraordinary trauma in their lives that's why they ended up where they are and and the mentors you know typically have been locked up for 20 30 40 years and you know it's uh, I, I think they have a better relationship with these younger guys than um maybe a teacher or a counselor would have for example so you know i, th- I think it's it's a it's a better way to run a prison system than the more traditional way, right? Um, it is the norm, not the exception in Germany, for example. I mean, I've been in the prisons in Germany as well. I mean, it's just a very different environment. I'm happy to describe the the German approach or the Norwegian approach, or you know, they just do it very differently. But more more importantly than anything else, the 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 rate of incarceration in those places is far lower than what we see here um you know in, in the u.s it's about 700 people for every hundred thousand are incarcerated um in germany it's like 70 right uh connecticut is much lower than pretty much any other state in terms of rate of incarceration which is good right but you know the the most countries that we would want to be associated with have a rate of incarceration somewhere between 100 and 200 per 100,000 people, and and we are right now, so we're 10,000 incarcerated, 3.7 million population. So, you know, we're about, um, we need to get down to about 7,000 to get into the high range of normal rate of Mm -hmm. incarceration. Right now we're about 370, I think, is where we are. 
And uh, so, you know, I, I, it, and, you know, I, I don't know if you're following this whole controversy more recently on commutations. I was going to get to that. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a predictable outcome from policy changes that were made 30, 40 years ago. Right. Um, as I said earlier, back before 1980, I mean, if you got a life sentence, it meant you were you did 25 years less good time, which got it down to 17 or 18, which is more or less what you would do for murder in Germany or Norway or Denmark or one of these places. And uh, so the now, you know, if you're doing a bid for murder and a few other things, you're not eligible for parole and there's no good time or no rec credits, right? So unless something happens, you're going to pretty much max out doing that. And so to me, that's like a really bad idea to do that kind of thing. Mm. And and so now what we're seeing is the only, I mean, there's half as many people locked up in Connecticut today as there was 15 years ago, literally half as many. Mm -hmm. um, the only part of the prison population that's actually getting bigger are people who are over the age of 60. Everything else is way down. And the younger the cohort, the bigger the reduction has been. I mean, we had 15 years ago, we had about a thousand people incarcerated. Uh, sorry, 15 years ago, we had about 3,800 people incarcerated between the ages of 18 and 24, mm -hmm. right? Now it's a thousand. So that's way, way down. Uh, the, the prison population is much older now than has ever been the case before. The part that's shrinking, that's getting smaller is the younger ones. The part that's expanding is the older one. So it's a whole different ball game at the moment, but it's these really long sentences that um, that we've never had before in Connecticut that now we're, you know, these are people locked up 20, 30 years already. And, and so now you got to figure something out. And so it makes people's heads explode when they hear about commutation for murderers, right? But it is worth keeping in mind that it used to be like this forever. And it's like this in most other places in the world. So... You know, if you don't like the commutation mechanism, you got to think of a different one, but um, it is what it is. I'm going to get back to the commutations, but I first want to ask you because you talk a lot about lowering the prison population. To me, the goal ought not to be that per se. I think it can happen, but the goal ought to be less crime. What right. can we do to actually bring crime down? Now, first of all, I mean, like, for instance, the war on drugs, it's ridiculous. And that drives a lot of our, our incarceration rates. I right. think it's absolutely absurd that you're putting people in prison for what they want to put in their own bodies. So I would get rid of that altogether. Mm -hmm. But a functioning prison system would actually help to rehabilitate offenders. And my point is that Connecticut claims and prisons elsewhere, too, but I'm just most familiar with Connecticut that they have these evidence-based programs that are actually re re, you know, rehabilitating offenders. Are you aware of any evidence-based programs in Connecticut in the prison system? Yeah, well, first of all, I don't know that any, I certainly have never claimed that any of this stuff is really effective, right? I mean, it's better than nothing for the most part, um, but ideally, if you're trying to deal with problems like mental health or substance abuse or homelessness or whatever, um, you know, you don't want to do that inside a correctional facility. You don't want to do it in the criminal justice system at all. I mean, it just make, doesn't make any sense. Um, but uh, there are things that seem to be somewhat effective in certain respects. So like uh, access to methadone while incarcerated for short periods of time, that kind of thing is very helpful in, in sustaining somebody who might be locked up for a month or two pre-trial while they're incarcerated so that when they go back out on the street, they resume the methadone as opposed to go out and score some contaminated stuff and end up dying from a fentanyl overdose. So, I mean, there's stuff like that that you can measure, depending on what your goals are, right? You can measure that it's better than not doing it. Right? So, that's well, about it. there is a vast amount of literature that shows that rehabilitation actually can take place in prisons. Well, but when guys are incarcerated, um, there's programs that actually have been yeah, shown but not the way work. their prisons are run in this country. Now, well, I, I don't, I, I don't see it. Right. Well, okay, I mean, well, okay, I that's they reboot the entire thing to get. That. I'm, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I'm not disagreeing. I, I think you're spot on. 
But when you're in the prison system or if you read the uh, mission statement or, or the, you know, the sort of goals of corrections and all that stuff, they tout it. And, you know, Governor Malloy, I mean, not Governor, well, he, him also, but Governor Lamont has touted what a great job they're doing. The commissioner certainly touts what a great job that the correctional system does. And that's my whole point is that the way it runs, the programs can't work. But the programs, first of all, the programs that they have aren't evidence based. Like I said, there's a vast amount of literature. You're going back to Stanton, Sam and Allen, Samuel Yokelson, uh, Andrews and Bonta, Paul Gendro, Francis Cullen, Deborah Ketzel, what works, what does it in reducing recidivism. It's vastly out there. They actually did a study and they asked 171 correctional practitioners if they could identify three criminogenic needs. Criminogenic needs is the fundamental concept in rehabilitation. Not one of the 171 correctional practitioners could identify them. When I read that, I tried it myself and I asked people in corrections. They couldn't do it either. That is a serious problem with the correctional system when they don't even know basics like that. At least, I mean, to yeah. me, it seems so. I just want to go back to something you said. Like, you know, I hang around these people. I know all these people. I know Governor Lamar. <clears throat> I know Governor Malloy. I, I travel in these circles, right? I don't think I ever heard any of them say that the Connecticut Department of Correction in any respect is doing a great job. I mean, that's not, you know, the, the goal is is more or less harm reduction, right? To make it less uh, harmful. And I think by virtue of the fact there's few people incarcerated for starters, um, you know, it's it's better than it used to be. And But there's much more that needs to be done. And as I said a few minutes ago, I, if it were up to me, I'd reboot the entire thing. I don't think you can actually do it, but if if I could, I would do it. And um, and and you asked, you know, to, you asked about what is the goal of the whole thing in the first place. And uh, I can't count the number of times I, because I've always believed you should be able to articulate what your goals are. Three goals, or so, you know, no matter what topic you're talking about. And so, for criminal justice policy, I the goals are. Uh, reduce crime, reduce spending, restore confidence in the criminal justice system in that order. And when I say restore confidence, I mean among African Americans who feel the sure. system is not fair. I mean among victims of crime who, who feel like they haven't come away with any kind of justice and, and confidence among citizens in general who every day pick up the paper and see examples of uh, corruption, et cetera, involving the police or prosecutors or courts or corrections or whatever. You know, I mean, this all undermines confidence in the criminal justice system. And if people lose confidence in the system, there's more crime. Right. So but goal number one is less crime. Uh, there definitely is less crime now than there was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, for sure. Uh, that's the number one goal, whatever. And, and anything that can help accomplish that goal that's the proper role of the criminal justice system. But much of what we do makes it worse, right? And, and you know, you mentioned the war on drugs. That would be a classic example of, you know, great idea, you know. Sure. And I'm old enough to remember when that whole thing got rolling in the mid-1970s. And presumably back then the goal was, well, if we rely on the criminal justice system to solve these problems, then what we should expect to see is fewer people using drugs, fewer people becoming addicted to drugs, fewer people dying because of, you know, all right, great. Here we are 40 years later and uh, you see the exact opposite. Uh, drugs are easier to get your hands on. They're more powerful. They're less expensive, you know? So if that didn't work, we should probably try something different. And, but making that, different thing happen in the context of the way politics works is really, really complicated. One of the things that uh, that Malloy, I think, takes some pride in is the so-called second chance society stuff in 2015, where, among other things, we eliminated mandatory sentences for possession of drugs in school zones. You know, I mean, and, and those I, I voted for those things when I was a in my early years as a legislator, because everybody, you know, in, in are you familiar with the Willie Horton commercial, Michael? You know <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, yeah. Uh, so Mike that, Dukakis, that was, I think it was. Yeah, it was the 1988 presidential campaign. And in the aftermath of that, every politician, Democrat, Republican, red state, blue state, the, the last thing they wanted to do was open themselves up to an argument that they're soft on crime because they voted for this or that 
quote unquote soft on crime thing. And that really led to the huge increase in the prison population in Connecticut and every state in the, you know, starting in the early 90s. And then on top of that is the war on drugs, right? So you put those two things together and you have, you know, completely out of control nightmare on your hands. Um, and, you know, there's so undoing the what I hope were the unintended consequences of these policy decisions is a heavy lift. And I, I've always been like an incrementalist, like one step at a time. Uh, the results I'm looking for are less crime. And and I and and spending, you know, I, I just there's an article today about the how much money is in the state budget to run the University of Connecticut, which has thirty two thousand full time undergraduate and graduate students, thirty two thousand. Uh, it's like five hundred and sixty million. The budget for the Department of Correction is six hundred and three million, and we've only got ten thousand people incarcerated. So. So when you tell people about that stuff, I mean, it, it, that makes no sense. Like, why does my kid have to pay more for tuition uh, and, while we're spending more money running our prison system, which is much smaller than the University of Connecticut? So, I mean, this kind of stuff is, you know, an eye opener for some people. And, and step by step, gradually, I think things are moving in the right direction. So you brought up commutations earlier. And I don't know if you know, but I actually testified against commutations in front of the uh, state judiciary committee. Okay. I am all for, I'm a big, big proponent of rehabilitation amongst criminals. Huge. I'm a big proponent of people being rewarded for doing what's right, for actually putting in the hard work that it takes to, to change. Mm -hmm. First of all, do you think that when somebody, that commutations should be reserved for inmates that have actually demonstrated or have are actually proven to be rehabilitated no in other words so okay so you don't even think that that is the the, the sort of standard to go by no okay because that's what they claim see this that's is where well that's what who claims well when, when i went and i listened to the testimony of the people that were in favor of these commutations they were talking about how guys have these guys have changed their lives around they deserve a break they deserve to get well, out of prison that sort of thing right the implication being that we, we you know these guys have changed that's why they're being let out it, it wasn't presented what what i think it was actually for is some type of social justice initiative to to, to make amends of reparations of sort to minority communities but that's not what they presented it as. I, like I said, that's speculation on my part. I'm not, I'm yeah, not saying so, I know it for a I fact. Mean, I, uh, to the extent people said stuff like that, I think what they're responding to is an argument that you're letting all these dangerous murderers out of prison early, right? Uh, um, and, and I think the issue is, are they or are they not? Do they Are they still dangerous, right? Is there any reason to think that this guy who's now 55, 60 years old has been locked up for 30 years for something he did when he was, you know, 21. Uh, is that a, is that a public safety risk? Right. Uh, and sometimes it might be, but sometimes it's not. And to me, like, that's the real issue. Do we really need to incarcerate this person for that long? It's not like they're not getting punished, but you know, doing, I mean, you did how many, what'd you do? 23 years. You said I did 25 years, 25 years. Yeah. So, I mean, what, that's not a punishment? I mean, that's more than you would do in pretty much any other civilized country or anything other than like blowing up a school full of school children. Or, you know, I mean, and and so the, it's the, the 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 length of the sentences and the extent to which they have to be served, especially here in Connecticut, leaves you no no choice. Like I said, in Texas, you'd have been out a lot earlier than that, ironically, right? Because it's Texas. See, you're making a sort of a different point here. Than what mm -hmm. is being made, well, at least what I saw made when I sat through the testimony at the the hearings. There it wasn't a hearing about the, the commutations per se. It was about the reappointment of the members of the uh, what's it, the committee that determines who gets commutations. The, the, the board of pardons and parole. Yeah. And the, over and over again, the argument was made that this is you know this is to reward guys who have shown themselves to be rehabilitated. Now you're talking about something different. But as far as the rehabilitation, so what my argument was is this. Look, you're talking about a situation where the rules aren't enforced in prison. And I know they're not. I'm there. Uh, you know, I was there for a very long time. The programming is, for lack of a better word, garbage. 
right? Mm. It's, a lot of it borders on what they call in the literature correctional quackery. Mm. And so if this is the case, my point was that the commutation board or the parole board has no viable means to determine who actually has been reformed. So what ends up happening is guys that I know personally from personal experience that have actually done the work to rehabilitate are being denied. Guys I know who have done nothing to rehabilitate or little to nothing to rehabilitate are getting commutations. And the general population is completely confused over what the criteria are to get a commutation. And I said, until they fix that problem, they should suspend the commutations. But your argument is just that, look, no. we're overpopulated. We've over-incarcerated. No, no, they gave us no, 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 no. Too not, long of not, sentences. Yep. My argument is not that we're overpopulated. We are overpopulated. My argument is these sentences are much longer than they need to be. And and we used to have a mechanism to deal with it. It was parole. But that's that's disappeared. For murderers. Should, yes. Okay. And for, well, for anything, really. But. The point is that these are the ones that we're talking about. The commutations typically involve people. I mean, it, it might have been murder, it might have been felony murder, it might have been uh, other crimes that get you these 50, 60 year sentences. That's what we're talking about. And 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 so there it, it's the idea that someone is gonna have to serve 50 years is is completely unheard of in most of the rest of the world right even most of the rest of the country right there the, the, there i mean there's a few states that lock up more people without the possibility of parole louisiana leaning the the charge here but you know most states have a mechanism to deal with this kind of stuff in connecticut the governor doesn't have commutation power only the board of pardons and parole does and so it's you know this is a workaround but this is a problem we never had before. We never had the number of people over the age of 60 growing every single year in Connecticut. We've got some other workarounds. Uh, we have the nursing home option, but that's only for people, you know, pretty seriously debilitated. But, you know, it's this is just imp improvisation to figure out how to deal with this problem. Now, it's not to say <laughs> that many of the people being considered for commutations have demonstrated that they're not the person they were when they shot somebody on the streets of New Haven at age 21. I mean, they're, these they're just different people. And uh, so that's relevant consider consideration. It's also important to keep in mind that the point of view of the victims in these incidents carries a lot of weight with the parole board. And so there are people who might, by any objective measurement, be clearly rehabilitated, whatever that means. But who are going to get denied because of the uh, the vehement opposition of victims in that particular case? So I mean, it's complicated. Uh, but to your point, it would be better if we had a system that was, you know, reliable. Like for example, the system we used to have back in the day, which was, you know, you're eligible for parole, and we'll take a look at it when we take a look at it, and you might get out, maybe you won't get out, right? Okay. But the commutations are this really complicated. Uh, controversial thing and then you get the prosecutor showing up i mean i used to be a prosecutor right the prosecutors come in and they say when well, we promised these people that this guy would do 50 years no ifs ands or buts like and and they make these kinds of promises to get plea bargains right but it's not true i mean the legislature tomorrow could retroactively change all the laws and make everybody eligible for parole sure so i mean why they're promising this stuff to people i mean i know why they're doing it that's the way to sell a a plea agreement, but all this stuff is just very counterproductive, in my opinion. You said something a, a minute or so ago that whatever that means in relation to rehabilitation, yeah. to me, it's clear what it means. It means that the guy is going to get out of prison. He's there. He's not going to violate the rights of other people. He's going to earn his keep in society and not be a burden. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it, it's pretty clear that that's what that means. Proving it is is you know not always an easy thing, especially with the, the given system. You said something interesting also a second ago about the, the basically the lies that are told in in the system about uh, you know this guy will never get parole when they can't promise that. I actually interviewed. I don't know if you. I'm sure you have heard of a Harvey Silverglade. Uh, he is a prominent civil rights attorney and I interviewed him and I told him that, oh, you know, it's funny because when a guy goes into a court and a guy pleads guilty for a, a, a plea bargain, 
The mm. question is always asked, have you been promised anything? Of course, I've been promised something. I've been promised a sentence. If I wasn't promised a sentence, I wouldn't be pleading guilty. But yeah, well, judges, don't, when they say that, they say, aside from the fact that you've been told that the recommendation is going to be this. I mean, yeah, the, but it's, yeah, yeah, it's more than a recommendation, though. And everybody knows it, right? Right. Yeah, right. but everybody's in on it. My lawyer's in on it. I'm in on it. The prosecutor and the judge is on it. It just breeds, like you said earlier, a lack of trust in the system. It's just, there's so many of those little things. And, you know, mm -hmm. someone might say, oh, what? That's just one thing. But it's just this the compilation of so many things within the system that leads to a lack of trust. It's it's that. It's the way the prison systems run. It's the fact that they're telling victims this guy can never get parole when they, they have no control over that, whether the guy right. gets parole or not. Right. So before I go, I, I have to ask you, I want you to, I'm going to make you dictator, dictator Lawler, the dictator of the prison system. You can implement any changes you want into the prison system. What do you do? Well, the, to me, like the most urgent, the first thing I would do is I would completely redo the whole bail system, right? To me, that's like the biggest problem. And, and, and it has really corrupted what goes on in the criminal justice, you know, in the courts, for example, more than anything else I've ever seen. It's very different than what it used to be. Uh, and if if I could do it tomorrow, I would adopt a system similar to what New Jersey recently adopted, which is that uh, the use of money bail, you know, setting amount of money to get for people to be out pretrial is uh, restricted quite a bit. But at the same time, um, people can be held pretrial without bail based upon an evidentiary showing uh, by the prosecutors that the person is either a danger to the community or a flight risk. And, you know, the end result of that would be, because we can see how it works elsewhere, would be a lot fewer people being held pretrial. You know, right now, the, the you know, we have 10,000 people locked up. Of, of those, about 37, 3,800 are sitting there because they can't afford to post bail. And, um, you know, many of them will spend spend only a few weeks or a few months locked up and they'll go to court and they'll get like time served or get probation or whatever. And, you know, based on my experience, I think the, the reason they're sitting in jail is so that there's more leverage to get them to plead guilty, take sure. probation. And, and that, you know, you just set people up for failure like that. And, you know, like the way I've tried to describe the criminal justice system, generally, it's kind of like quicksand, right? If you get into it, it's hard to get out. The more you struggle, the deeper you go. And and to me, it's it's you know that by itself is sort of a criminogenic feature, right? You're you're making it worse. And so, the you know the 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 sanctions that are available in criminal justice world uh, should be reserved for situations where they're absolutely necessary. And and I think you know the for a variety of reasons, all the most complicated, intractable problems that society has to deal with get dumped on the police who in turn have no other alternative but to arrest people and then you're in the court system you got lawyers making decisions that really social workers should be making and and you know it, it's just really really a bad system so the front end to me is the main focus the back end whether it's commutations or parole or whatever would be my second list you know i would I like the system that they have in most of the rest of the civilized world, which is, you know, um, people who get in car, very few people get incarcerated in the first place. If you do get incarcerated, the way the facilities are run is completely and totally different than what is done here. And even with that, you know, your ability to get uh, paroled, even be released on weekends to spend time with your family is, you know, it's much more commonplace. I mean, I can tell you a story because I, I love the in the class I teach to tell this particular story. We went to visit this uh, prison outside of Berlin. Uh, it's called Heidering Prison, in Germany. It's a maximum security facility. And we were in a group, the governor and Scott Semple and myself and a bunch of people from around the U.S., uh, prosecutors, judges, legislators, people who formerly incarcerated, you know, a mixture of people, like 60 of us. <clears throat> and we go to this place called Hydering, and we pull up in a bus, you know, and there's like a 30 foot wall around the outside. That wasn't a surprise. You go inside and it was like entering a, a brand new community college campus, right? There's carpeting on the floor, big glass corridors. Um, they take us to, we'll just call it a cell block for now. 
you know, where the, the people incarcerated live. You know, nobody's got any kind of uniform on, not the people incarcerated, not the staff. They have different colored name tags, basically. Everybody has a single, right? Um, the, you go into one of these rooms and there's like a big window with curtains on it. There's a real bed. There's a wooden desk with a wooden chair. There's a private bathroom with its own shower. Uh, the people incarcerated have their own keys to their own, let's just call it a cell. They can lock it from the inside. There's no window on the door, uh, you know, and, and and so we're walking down the hallway and one of the American corrections guys says to the German guy, um, you know, on the left, there's like this big glass enclosed room. He's, he says, what's that? And the German guy says, it's uh, it's a kitchen because if the, the guys, if they don't wanna go to the dining hall, they can prepare their own meals. And, and he goes, oh, he goes, well, there's knives in there. German guy says, well, it's a kitchen, right? And the American guy says, so how often do you have an incident? The German guy says, what do you mean by incident? He goes, well, you know, somebody gets stabbed or something. And he says, I don't know, we've been open like five years. Nothing like that's ever happened here. So the American guy's looking at the German guy like he's crazy. The German guy's looking at the American guy like he's crazy. It, it was such an interesting thing to see play out. And, and you know, as you said earlier, to work in DOC in Germany, you know, the academy is two years long. And what you're learning is not how to wrestle with inmates and pepper spray people. You're taking, you know, de-escalation and sociology and psychology and all this kind of stuff. And if you ask the guys who work there, like, so what is your job, right? And they all say the same thing. Our job is to prepare these men to re-enter the community. That's our job, right? And so, you know, this is kind of nice. Like, where's the punishment? So the punishment is the deprivation of liberty, right? And it's, it's you know, when you see this, it's like, wow, I guess, right? And, and you know, then people say, well, you know, it's Germany. Everybody with Lederhosen and stuff. Like, no, no, this is Berlin. Berlin is its own state. has a population the same as Connecticut. And you know half of berlin are immigrants you know like from turkey and syria and bulgaria and Belarus. you know i mean they've got organized crime there's graffiti all over the place you know it, it, it nobody has guns so there's not a lot of murders going on but apart from that you know i mean it's a pretty diverse population so it it's it's it just shows you that you can you can do this without i mean and the germans is not perfect by any stretch but it is so different than here in the U.S. and and it's it's like something. If I could wave a magic wand and make that happen here, that's what I would do. Before I let you go, is there any question I didn't ask or anything I didn't let you get to that you'd like to say? Well, well, you know, we could talk about this, and I would be happy to talk about this for a week straight. But uh, yeah, no, I think we covered a lot of ground. And but um, you know, the thing I want to emphasize is. I don't think anybody is really saying that the Connecticut prison system does a great job. It's definitely different than what it used to be. And in, in some measurable ways, it's better. There's like a lot fewer people in it. Um, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And, you know, we're in the sort of this tidal shift of, you know, tough on crime, soft on crime. And and the, the hardest thing to do is to resist um, going backwards in time when these tragedies occur you know the cheshire murders was like a great opportunity to wreck everything and it actually got better instead of worse after that so um I, I, one frustrating thing i have feeling i have about not being in the mix of the capital as a legislator or working for the government is that i, I can i can see people wanting to take backward steps just knee-jerk reaction mm -hmm. And 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 it's it's a little bit frustrating when they actually do that sometimes, but they, they resisted most of the most of the worst impulses. So I don't know, but uh, you know, Michael, you and others who have been incarcerated have important stories to tell, and people need to hear them. And because I think most people think the world is divided into two groups of people: criminals and everybody else, and it's not quite like that, you know. So um, anyway. That's what I want. To I'm going to find the quotes from former Governor Malloy, from Governor Lamont, from commissioners. All the quotes I can find where they're touting what uh, what a wonderful job the prison system in Connecticut does. And I'm going to get them to you and I'm going to post them to Facebook because I'm <laughs> telling you they're there. 
No, I think there, what you see happening is people celebrating steps in the right direction. But I, I'm very doubtful that anyone ever used the word wonderful. <laughs> and uh, uh, and and because I know how former Governor Mueller feels about these things. Um, and and I, I think if he were sitting here answering your questions, you'd get very similar answers from him. Well, if I could get in touch with him, I'd love to have him on. <laughs> Okay, where can people find you? You got to have a website, something, right? Yeah, well, I teach at the University of New Haven and I have a website there. I'm on Facebook. I put a lot of my own like personal blog. I'm on Twitter, at Mike Lawler. Uh, so I don't do too much original stuff. It's mostly retweeting <laughs> stuff. But, uh, you know. Well, Mike, totally I appreciate you. Website. Thank you so much for taking the time to to come yeah. on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for answering all my questions. And maybe I'll have you on again sometime because, like you said, we could talk about this stuff for a week. Anytime. See for you. now, this is the Rational Egoist signing out. Michael Leibowitz. Remember, like, share, comment, subscribe. Till next time.